am Michelle Malik and you're watching In This Special. Today is the 23rd day of the complete clampdown in Kashmir. Two main hospitals within the region have confirmed that in the first 17 days of the crackdown, over more than 150 people have suffered injuries from tear gas and pellet guns. These are just figures from two hospitals. Human rights activists are fearing the numbers could be much higher. On today, today's show, we take a close look at what we know so far about what's unfolding within Kashmir and the human cost of India's authoritarian lockdown. Joining us for this discussion is Mr. Manpreet Singh, representative of World Sikh Parliament, joining us from London. We're also joined by Barrister Abdul Majid Tambu, permanent representative to United Nations for International Human Rights Association of American Minorities. He's also joining us from London. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen, and welcome to this show. Mr. Singh, I'd like to begin with you. Now, Kashmir is one of the most militarized zones in the world with more than a half of a million troops situated there. And before this crackdown, more deployment of troops. Now, when we're talking about the injuries with the use of pellet guns, what do you think could possibly warrant that on the people when already they're being surveilled under so many heavily militarized men with arms and guns pointed at them? Definitely, definitely, there is no two ways about it that Kashmir is actually a living hell at the minute of uh, anger and fear. I mean, there's no two ways about it, what's happening there with people. But what I would like to highlight here is, uh, Michelle, is uh, it's not it's not unprecedented uh, of India doing that. India has done that before. I mean, just to mention, there was a 560 page long report which was submitted to the UN and UN actually accepted that. As, a, as admissible evidence or as a primary evidence to open an investigation. This report is full of the inhumane torture that uh, the Indian administration has done to the people of Kashmir, whether they, will, they, were, they were shot down with pellet guns or tear gas or whatever, or subject, subjected to various type of tortures when they were actually protesting or uh, when they are being detained in, 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 in Indian police stations and and army camps and stuff like that. So what I'm trying to say is this: this is not this is not anything new. Now with India doing such a clampdown on Kashmiri people on such a large scale, I am just amazed at how world is actually being numb about it. I can't digest the fact how can West be so numb about it? How can United Nations not sending, they have still not send their first responders peacekeeping force Mr. to, Singh, the, to now, Kashmir. Now, hold on to that. You've stated how can the world be so quiet to what's happening. I want to take now this question alongside uh, a couple of other things to Barrister uh, Trambu and ask him now, Pakistan wants to take Kashmir's case to the ICJ. They obviously have a strong case given that the reports that have come out by the United Nations itself, by other various human rights uh, organizations itself. But what is the response that is anticipated from the other end when this case is taken? And what do you think will be the international response? Well, uh, uh, it's a fair question. Uh, the first and foremost important thing is uh, whether and if uh, the government of Pakistan has now actually decided to take the matter to ICJ. Now, ICJ has uh, two portfolios to determine uh, any, any case that comes before them from a country. And that's A is contentious issues and second is advisory issues. Whatever little I have heard is that Pakistan most probably is going in an advisory capacity to ask the ICJ to give its advice to both the countries. It, it is a very important step. I must say that if Pakistan decides to go there and has actually now made the preparation to go to ICJ, both on the general human rights situation and as well as on the abrogation of Article 370, this is something which we Kashmiris all look forward to see that it happens. And if it goes there, then we have all to work together to see that we get a positive response. As Manpreet was saying, there is a human rights, a very, very huge report from the United Nations, not only of 2018. We have another report from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which came out on 5th July 2019. So it has become now a regular yearly practice for the United Nations 
to issue this uh, reports on Kashmir, which is a very healthy sign. And therefore, those reports together with other intergovernmental organizing, uh, organization reports, such as from the European Union or even from OIC, will help the case in ICJ. And I hope it is uh, being advocated in the best possible manner, both on human rights situation, on the right to self-determination, and on the issue of abrogation of Article 370. Right. And Minister Tharmo, you yourself have said right now that the United Nations has carried out investigations and in what it is happening. It has become almost a regular occurrence when they're issuing statements regarding Kashmir. So what is this backlog about? Why aren't they taking solid steps to solve what is happening? Now, a four, a four weeks lockdown in the area, God knows what is happening. Only from the few reports that we are hearing, we're talking about grave, grave human rights violations. What's the inertia about? Well, uh, it is very much uh, unacceptable situation that's happening at the moment in Kashmir, but uh, in Indian occupied Kashmir. But you, you've got to bear in mind um, that this is, this is uh, a situation which has prevailed in Kashmir over the last 30 years. We are talking here over the last 30 years Hundred more than 100,000 people have been killed and maimed is countless and blinded are also countless. So this, the current situation, the lockdown situation is in line with what India has been doing um, over the last, well, 70 odd years, but particularly 30 years they have been doing this. But what is important thing to bear in mind is that this is not the end game of India. This is what one has to understand. Abrogation of Article 370, one has to understand why have they done it? And why is this lockdown? The lockdown is not for the sake, simply for the sake of causing inconvenience to people of Kashmir or Indian occupied Kashmir, or to cause them any further injuries or harm. It's, it has a long-term implications and the implications are the consequences of abrogation. And that's what is very horrific. And that's in terms of India now wants to see that they bring corporate India to Kashmir to have Indian businesses established in Indian occupied Kashmir. And then they bring also the workforce from India to Kashmir. This is what is going to happen. Right. Barrister, I'm going to hold on to that thought. Mr. Singh, while we're hearing about all of this, and I highlighted uh, there before, and Barrister Zambu has said that this is a very long-standing issue. Now, it is one of the longest disputes on the United Nations agenda. It still fails to be resolved. At this point in time, there is uh, we look towards the international community, and we look towards governments and global leaders, but what role do individuals need to play at this point in time to pressurize their governments? Um, yeah, I'm sure. Sure, I, I completely agree with the with, with what whatever Mr. Abdul has just said. I mean, this is a long, outstanding issue. But I would like to add one more thing to it. It's not just the uh, the Kashmiri people that have been uh, have been at at the mercy of Indian administ administration for tortures and uh, and all these other human rights violations. Is it been the Sikhs? It's been the Seven Sister States in. Nog, people of the Nagaland and people in, in South and Tamils. And we, we all have had a similar history of Indian administration torturing us for a long time. We have lost, Sikhs have lost about 100,000 100, people since 1984. What we are trying to say here is this is, this is what people need to wake up to. This is uh, Modi, which is the current prime minister of India, is a hardcore Hindu nationalist who wants to turn India into a Hindu state. Now, this is what we need to now just rewind ourselves and take us back to the 70, 70 years right. back when India and Pakistan was created. What India promised was to be a secular democratic state. Now, this is not just betraying the people of Kashmir. This is pe they, they are betraying 
all other minorities, right. all other minorities, which they sometimes call Hindu, but they're not Hindu. We have recently seen the Ravidas temple, which about 30 to 40 percent of the Indian population, which they classify as scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, they are not part of the, the Hindu religion. Their temple has been set on fire recently, and we've seen a mass demonstration in, in India's capital, Delhi. Now, what we are trying to say is this prime minister on the lines of Hitler, on the lines of Nazi Germany, is on a rage to convert the whole India into a, a, a Hindu minority, a Hindu state. Right, and Mr. Now, Singh, we, uh, uh, that is hard evidence that whatever is happening in Kashmir is as atrocious as it is. It's also happening in India with the minorities there because that's the plan of the Modi government. On that note, I'd like to introduce another guest who's joined us, Ms. Sovia Shaw, activist from London. Now, Ms. Shaw, you being from London and fighting for the Kashmiri cause, now, what is the game plan for the protesters there? How do you think they're working towards trying to pressurize at least their own government? I mean, we've had a protest recently in London whereby everybody joined. Um, we have, we've written to the uh, Prime Minister of the UK and we have um, written open letters out. There, has, there is a, another protest in the city of Manchester and Bradford where people from all over the world, not just um, people from Indian occupied Kashmir who are living or studying overseas, but also people from dip different parts of the world whose rights have been abolished the same as Kashmiris, the right of liberty, the right of life, the, the life of simple security of a person. So there are different protests and rights going on. We are writing and, and inviting people from all over the world to um, speak against this um, and, you know, help out the Kashmiri people. And young students basically have um, been sending out leaflets. There has been barcodes going around in um, universities where, you know, um, one thing that has come good out of the situation, if, the, if to say the least, is um, that at least the Kashmiri issue of the Indian occupied Kashmir has been highlighted now, highlighted in the sense of media, and people are... Mm -hmm now willing to understand the situation, things that are happening for, since 1947, at least now it's been highlighted and people are willing to take a stand and young students who are overseas who, ha who haven't had their contact, for example, myself as well, family all in Kashmir, in Srinagar, in um, Baramula and Sopor have had no contact, all the medical amenities, everything is closed down. So right. we are just here um, as students just trying to um, shed light on the issue and that's the least right. we could do at the moment. And Ms. Shal, you mentioned that at least the Kashmiri issue now has been highlighted with whatever has happened. Barrister Trambu, now talking a little about India's state. Now, it's not a rogue state. It's integrated into the global trade system. It has diplomatic ties with other countries. It claims to be a democratic state. It's not supposed to be acting like a rogue state. Now, if India is not taken to task, if it is not held accountable for the atrocities that it is conducting and carrying out in Kashmir, how does that set a dangerous precedence for other countries to follow? India now is, and it should be called as Hindutva Fascist India. It is now epicenter of racism. Racism in terms neither the uh, Indian Muslims are safe, nor Christians are safe, nor Sikhs are safe, nor Dalits are safe, nor untouchables are safe. That's besides the issue of Kashmir. Issue of Kashmir is an international recognized issue. Therefore, it, it has a different uh, segments altogether. But yes, we need to be proactive in projecting India with whatever uh, colorful they may have in terms of trade or in terms of democracy. We have to present the current picture of India as Hindutva fascist right. India, which is the epic center of racism. Right. And Barrister Tambu, Pakistan is, of course, at the forefront of this issue. They are the ones leading and in the creation of this narrative. But the question also resides with the international bodies who are responsible for making sure that countries abide by resolutions, that they do not violate uh, general conventions that have been set out, those that are supposed to protect human rights. Now, with that, it seems like there is no response there. What can be happening on that account? What needs to happen on that account? Well, um, unfortunately, um, uh, in, in, in the real world, the human rights uh, countries who, who plead human rights countries possibly are the biggest violator, violators of human rights. 
But we don't have to give up the hope. We should never give up the hope. United Nations is there. United Nations mechanism is there, which we as Kashmiris are using at every level. This is why you have the United Nations report, two reports, one after another. And there are other mechanisms that we have to put into place. Uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights is holding a briefing, hopefully on 4th September, in which a Kashmiri delegation will join and raise the Kashmiri issue. All sorts of international mechanisms, whichever are there, whether it's in terms of United Nations, European Union, or in terms of ICJ, International Court of Justice, ICC even, that's International Criminal Court, we need to utilize it. We need to keep on the pressure. We need to build on the pressure. We should not simply give up the hope. India is not an indispensable country, and I'm sure India will have its heat and she will have to bend before the world opinion. Right. Mr. Singh, do you believe that that's what the people are working towards, continuously creating this pressure so India has to bend before the law? It has to take into account that what it's doing, it's not a rogue state. It has uh, certain conventions that apply to it that it itself has ratified, but that it is violating continuously. Yeah, Michelle, uh, I would like to mention two things here. When speaking of international uh, conventions, India has already raised its concern, official concern, of the 1966 Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which gives the uh, right of self-determination to people. India has raised an official reservation against this law, and it's still a member of the United Nations. Now, speaking of another convention, India agrees to the genocide prevention, uh, uh, the, the articles there, which are embedded in the United Nations covenants. But in the recent case of Sajjan Kumar, I would like to, I mean, you, you guys need to make a note of it. Indian High Court have said itself that Indian law is not equipped to criminalize, criminalize genocide. So this is not me saying it. This is the Indian High Court saying that we cannot actually get the perpetrators behind the bar because our law is not equipped to criminalize uh, uh, such a heinous crime like a genocide. So what I'm trying to say is India, whatever India has been doing till now, this is high time that we need to see that all open an independent investigation by United Nations and to see what's going wrong in India at a judicial level, at, at, uh, at the administration level. But yes, well, as far as the international uh, diaspora is concerned, as far as the international pressure is concerned, I think as individuals, we have a huge responsibility. We all, in, in whichever country we're sitting, whether it be Sikhs or Kashmiris or Muslims, any genocide uh, uh, that has been happening to any sort of community, any right. human rights violations, we need to highlight with our prospective uh, countries, respective countries, and they need to raise a voice. Now, what I would like to say through your media is, right now, we all are demonstrating against India. But if the West doesn't keep up to its responsibility, if the United Nations doesn't keep up to its responsibility, soon there will be demonstration outside right. your embassies. Soon right. there will Mr. be a demonstration Singh, out Hold on to that thought. Since we're short on time, I want to get to Ms. Shaw and talk a little about how uh, when you interact with the Kashmiri diaspora within London, you talk to people who have families within Kashmir, and it's almost the fourth week now that they are not able to contact them. What are some of the fears prevailing amongst the people? Um, so people have like um, not just people at the protest, but people in Kashmir who haven't, um, people in the UK, sorry, who haven't had contact with um, anybody in, at home. Uh, to be honest, my family members were really, really sick, and we haven't spoken to them for four weeks now. Had to travel all the way out of Kashmir to Jammu, and they had to um, use the medical facilities there. So all the primary data coming out on YouTube or Instagram videos that people have shared um, and WhatsApp messages for people, students who have come out of um, Kashmir and gone to Delhi and have contacted us is completely different to the view and opinions of um, the Indian media that's been shown on television. So um, we are just here trying to the minim minimal thing that we're asking and requesting in a protest which in London, which happened um, two weeks ago. Um, and everybody was in tears just on the fact that Students who are just outside, the least that we are asking for the Indian Army at the moment to do is to get rid of um, the Indian military presence from the Kashmiri towns and villages and allow some sort of contact with their families. Right. 
Right. Professor Swambu, now just before we end this segment, I want to go to the point that uh, Mr. Singh was making and highlighting that there needs to be an independent investigation carried out within India's judicial system to at least hold them accountable for all that is being happening happening within Indian occupied Kashmir. Now, India has rejected both of the U uh, United Nations investigations that were carried out in 2018, 2019. Do you think this would be possible to ever hold India internally accountable for what, it, uh, what has been happening in Indian occupied Kashmir? Well, uh, again, realistically speaking, if India is now developing a Hindutva fascist state, then what do you expect from its judiciary? That is that is the big question now. I do not have much hope with the Indian judiciary, and I don't think that they will take this on. For instance, you have before Indian Supreme Court the Article 370 abrogation. If Indian judiciary was so strong, when Modi government issued the ordinance abrogating the Kashmir, the, the Article 370, Indian Supreme Court should have butted in and said, you can't do it because the petition is before us. It's only an ordinance. It's not the act of parliament. For the judicial system over there as well. Now, everything that's been painted to us is, of course, a very grim picture. And we continue to wonder what is unfolding in Kashmir. But unfortunately, that's the t uh, time's up for this segment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manpreet Singh, for joining us from London. Thank you, Barrister Abdul Majid Rambu, for joining us. And thank you, Sobia Shal, for joining us. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we're going to have another story for you. Stay with us. Welcome back to Indus Special. Now, the United Nations has released a report by an independent international fact-finding mission on Myanmar. The mission found that sexual and gender-based violence was a hallmark of the Tadwa Dwa's operations in northern Myanmar and in Rakhine. We take a closer look at what's been found in this report and what the future looks like for minorities in Myanmar. Joining us for this discussion is Phil Robertson, Deputy Director of Human, of Human Rights Watch Asia Division, joining us from Bangkok, and Nason Lin, Campaign and M Media Relations Coordinator of the Free Rohingya Coalition, joining us from Frank Frankfurt. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Mr. Robertson, now this report talks about how there was genocidal intent on the part of the army that was carrying out the sexual violence. And this genocidal intent was to erase or destroy the Rohingya people in whole or in part. Now, tell us how widespread was the use of sexual violence by the army? The fact-finding mission of the UN found that it was systematic and pervasive. Uh, that in every area that the Tatmada was operating in northern Rakhine State as part of the clearance operations uh, that took place starting in August 2017, that there was use of gang rape uh, and rape by the military and in some cases police against Rohingya women and girls. And the fact that uh, so many of the women and girls were uh, you know, targeted because they were of rep reproductive age, in many cases, there was uh, mutilation, uh, killing of uh, women and girls after they were raped. Uh, it was quite clearly uh, a policy of the uh, Myanmar military to, to do this, to try to uh, intimidate the Rohingya and to achieve what they did achieve, which is to uh, chase uh, the Rohingya out of the country. And, and more than 740,000 left in a period of several months. Right. And you're saying here that it was see by the Myanmar army. Now, a question that would generally come up in a discussion like this is when there are such widespread atrocities being carried out, the burning down of homes, the killing of people, torture and violence. Why specifically focus on gendered violence? Why is that important to take into account? Well, what we're talking about is, about is 50 percent of the population when you're talking about women and girls. But also this report found that there was a, a sexual and gender based violence against men and boys as well in, in a number of cases. Uh, this is all about intimidating and destroying uh, the, the, the community and the people in it, uh, that the Rohingya communities where you had these tight knit communities, people 
uh, who have lived in these places for a long period of time, and you you systematically destroy the people by uh, abusing them and forcing them to flee and creating a degree of fear uh, that if they return back, uh, they would face such violations again. Uh, this is a part of the, the tactics of the Tatmadaw to target civilians when they're trying to eradicate insurgencies. And they don't just do it against the Rakhine and I mean against the Rohingya, but they're doing it against the ethnic Rakhine in, in northern Rakhine state now. And they've done it against other ethnic minorities in the past, right. the Kachin, the Karen, the Mon and others. Right. And Mr. Robertson, you highlighted here for us the ethnic of violence carried out within Myanmar isn't just... Uh, specific to the Rohingya, and this is something that I want to get Mr. Lewin's take on it as well. How has systematic violence been carried out against other ethnic minorities as well? Well, the civil war is going on in Myanmar since uh, early uh, 1950, since after the independence of Burma in 1948 from the British colonial. And since then, you know, there were the disagreement between the Myanmar army and the Myanmar, uh, but the Burmese government and the uh, ethnic uh, group. Then, you know, uh, some ethnic group, they, they have established that their insurgency and, you know, there have been the civil war starting since then. This is the wall, longer civil war going on. So, like, you know, what happened to Rohingya, it happened to the Karen, it happened to the Shan and other ethnic minority as well. There were hundreds of villages that destroyed, uh, thousands of women were raped. In 2001, if you look to the uh, report published by the Shan Women Organization, uh, 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 License to Rape Report, they have documented 625 young and uh, young uh, Shan women were raped by the Myanmar army. So. In 1978, also, when the Rohingya were uh, driven off from the uh, country to uh, Bangladesh, at the time also, Rohingya women and the girl were raped. This is repeating again and again because of the impunity. You know, there is hmm. no legal action against the Myanmar military or the government. So this has been continuing. And right. in, in the country, there are all the ethnic minority are suffering, but these are the war crimes. And the crime against humanity, what Rohingya, uh, what happened to Rohingya is exactly genocide, as the UN fact-finding mission has reported. Right. And Mr. Uh, Lewin, you're hiding here how it's a uh, complete genocide, what is happening there, and the United Nations has found it. Now, Mr. Robertson, going to the United Nations and talking a little about them, now the United Nations General Assembly has authorized uh, the establishment of an international independent mechanism with a budget of $28 million to try to find out what's happened in Rohingya. But earlier in June, uh, the United Nations admitted itself that it did not do enough when it came to Myanmar and the ethnic cleansing that was being carried out from there. Now, what do you make out of the role of this organization when we talk about Myanmar and the genocide that is being carried out there? Well, these are these are two different parts of the UN, and, and it's important to distinguish them. Uh, the IIM, uh, which you're talking about, which has the budget, the budget of $28 million, that is going to continue the work of the fact-finding mission whose report we're talking about today. Uh, that will be preparing case files, identifying culprits, and ultimately preparing for international accountability in front of an international judicial panel for those people who are involved in perpetrating these abuses or ordering these abuses. Uh, ideally, uh, we will find a way to get the military, military commanders to the International Criminal Court, but uh, failing that, you know, there might be an independent tribunal or some other arrangement made, and the files and the work that will be done by that, that mechanism will be very important. The, the report you mentioned about the UN failures really talks about what happened with the UN resident coordinator uh, uh, and also the UN country team. And the, the failure that they, uh, they, they were involved in in trying to prevent uh, the violence against the Rohingya. There were plenty of warning signs and indications that uh, there was something afoot. Uh, we had seen in 2016 these kind of abuses uh, in a, and on smaller scale and, 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 a, and against a smaller group of villages where there were uh, ARSA attacks and then retaliation by the uh, Tatmadaw. Uh, 
so they, you know, the, the UN should right. have known. And, and as a result of the failures uh, of the UN uh, country team and the human rights up front framework that they were supposed to be carrying out, then there was a critical report done about that. Right. Uh, Mr. Roberts, uh, a quick last question to you. Now, you're talking about taking the case and building it up to the International Criminal Court. Do you actually see something happening after that, given the United Nations track record and how it seemed to dragging its heels over many of the issues we see unfolding in front of our eyes today? Well, the, the, the International Criminal Court is, is assessing whether they can take action against uh, Myanmar connected to the crime of deportation because the Rohingya ended up in Bangladesh, and Bangladesh is a member of the International Criminal Court. But there's also a discussion about referring Myanmar to the International Court of Justice uh, connected to the Genocide Convention and their ratification of the treaty and failure to uphold that. And there's also then the kind of work that the Human Rights Council is doing. So. Uh, efforts are being pursued on multiple tracks. I am confident that eventually we will see uh, Senior General Min Aung Lai and top military commanders of the Tat Madaw uh, in front of uh, international courts uh, facing justice. Uh, and I think that you know the international community has to redouble its efforts uh, to make sure that outcome uh, is possible. Right. On that note, thank you so much, Mr. Ferguson, for joining us and talking to us from Bangkok. Mr. Lin, going back to you, now your organization represents the thoughts and the feelings and the opinions of the Rohingya people. Now, repatriation is on the table once again, and there are talks being carried out uh, regarding it. What are the sentiments of the Rohingya people regarding that? This is, this is the third time uh, the Bangladesh government is trying because, you know, they have signed the agreement in January 2018 and they have tried and they fail again in November. They fail again uh, just a few days ago. They fail because, you know, there is no assurance for the uh, 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 security and the citizenship from the uh, Myanmar side. Uh, uh, last month, when the Myanmar delegation visited to the camp, they have said that uh, they, they will issue the nationalized citizenship for the uh, Rohingya returnee, and before that, they will hand out the national verification card. So Rohingya have been rejecting that this national verification since uh, they have created this card in 2015, and also since we are indigenous uh, ethnic group belong to the uh, this uh, Arkana state, we cannot be the nationalized citizenship. Uh, they are offering us the nationalized citizenship. When they are trying to erase our existence and the, our history. Right. So this is completely impossible. And also, we need the protection because there is no guarantee that they will uh, persecute again. Okay? And also, what they have to allow us to... What would that protection entail? Now, what would that protection entail? The protection has to be from the international community, from the, uh, you know, the, uh, maybe from the superpower country or the ASEAN country, any country or the, uh, the, the country make the collation that they can assure our security, then we can go back. Right. Now, Mr. Luen, a question that many people would ask is regarding the actual cultural workings and political workings within Myanmar. Now, who really is in control when we're talking about politics? Now, Aung San Suu Kyi, the state councillor, has seen a fall from grace after it was revealed everything was happening under her, uh, uh, under her care and her overlooking it. But is she really the one in power? Or is it the junta? Yeah. It is true that the power is in the hand of uh, military. They are controlling. And the top uh, 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 committee is called the National uh, Security and the Protection or something like that. They have the 11 members. In 11 members, six of them are from the uh, military and five of them are from the uh, 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 civilian uh, government, including the Aung San Suu Kyi and the president. So since they have the only five vote, and the military is always, you know, they have the majority vote there. So all the, uh, you know, the national, uh, national security or the top agenda, all they discuss there. So the president, you see, you will never see, only very rarely you are seeing in the news. And the state councillor Aung San Suu Kyi, she's always moving here and there. But she has no power at all. And also 
like you know the, the right. European country and the uh, America, uh, US or she cannot visit at all you know she she doesn't have the Im image like before right. uh, she is she is seen by the international community as she's complicity in, in the ongoing genocide Right. Now, she's a complicit in the genocide that's being carried out. But like you're saying, the real power is uh, in the hands of the military. Now, what is the end game that the military wants in terms of here? The persecution, as we established before, isn't just of the Rohingya. Now, most of the Rohingya have seemed to fled uh, from the country, tried to refuge in other countries. But the other ethnic minorities continue to face persecution. What does the military want? The failure of the United Nations and the international community. They, they are not, not taking any serious uh, action against the, this Myanmar military. Because of this impunity, they are continuously committing the crime against the uh, Rohingya right. because there are, there are a still more than 500,000 remain inside the country and also the other ethnic minority. And also the Russia and the China are always backing the Myanmar military and we cannot take any action against the Myanmar military at the right. inter, uh, uh, UN Security right. Council. Uh, Mr. Lewin, hold on to that now. Uh, uh, the, the military in Myanmar has impunity for whatever war crimes they're carrying out, whether it's genocide or a, a massive sexual violence. Uh, now, I want to introduce another guest to our discussion here, Ms. Anna Roberts, Executive Director of the Burma Campaign, joining us from London. Now, Ms. Roberts, something that I want to focus on is why is it important to highlight the Rohingya issue as not just pertaining to Myanmar, but as being an international issue? Well, uh, it's very important because obviously, you know, we've seen from your the, the reports that you're doing there the, the the scale and scale and intensity of violence that's been committed against ethnic Muslim Rohingya in Burma. We saw what the UN describe as uh, the ongoing side starting two years ago, but of course that's uh, just the latest, most uh, grievous assault against uh, the Rohingya. They've been suffering. Uh, brutalization and discrimination for decades. Um, and we've seen that uh, become an international issue since uh, uh, two years ago with the genocide. Um, obviously, with Bangladesh, more than 700,000 refugees fleeing to Bangladesh. Um, and the ongoing conflict is creating uh, regional insecurity. And it's absolutely um, an international issue because the crimes which the Burmese military are accused of are the most serious international crimes and violations of international law, right. war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. And so the international community has an obligation to act on those crimes. Right. And Ms. Roberts, you mentioned here how it's creating regional insecurity. Explain to our viewers how exactly what is happening within Myanmar and Bangladesh to an extent because of the, uh, because of the refugees going there. But how is it creating instability within the entire region? Well, obviously, uh, Bangladesh has uh, experienced the most uh, severe consequences of this in terms of the it is now hosting the largest refugee camp in the world with around uh, one million uh, Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. Other neighboring countries are also hosting uh, refugees, Rohingya refugees, but also uh, refugees from Burma's other ethnic minorities. And the fact is, because this is an ongoing issue, you know, Burma was under military dictatorship for many years since its so-called transition process, which is not a transition to democracy at all. You know, we've seen not a decrease in human rights, but actually an escalation of human rights. And the fact that the international community has uh, not been prepared to put pressure and uh, put put uh, consequences for the military for these actions, then, you know, we just see this cycle of violence continue. And that means there will be more, more violence, more refugees, but also, you know, Burma and its neighbours will come under pressure to deal with the situation and take action in international forums, such as you know, the Security Council at the UN. Right. Uh and on that point, Evelyn, when I, I want to ask you, what do you think the reaction from the international community has been like so far? 
Yeah, they have been issuing the many statements of concern, worry, you know, they have been uh, promising us, us that they are going to take the action. And they have to, uh, you know, show us something that they are doing, like, you know, just uh, a, a, a few weeks ago, you know, U.S. have uh, imposed the sanction for the top four military general, just, you know, they're barring them uh, from going a holiday to America, you know. But are and these then, bans, uh, are these moves just appeasement or do they actually mean something? No, 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 there's nothing, you know. They, are, they, they will never travel to U.S. or the uh, uh, European country. So, you know, these are not the serious action. If they want to take the serious action, there is the International uh, Court of Justice, there is the International uh, Criminal Court, they can also establish the uh, independent tribunal or something, you know. They can really change our faith. But they have been, you know, you just stay in the camp, we will feed you, we are doing, you know. These people have been in the camp for two years now. And, you know, their life does try, you know, there is no access to the education. There, there is very limited to the health care. You know, everything is, you know, very limited, right. you know. Compared, compared to the other refugee camp uh, across the wall in Jordan or the Turkey, you know. If you see the Rohingya situation, completely different, you know. So no right. one is really... And Mr. Luan, uh, uh, hold on to that thought because I want to take this point to Ms. Roberts and ask her, that, do you think serious action isn't be being taken by the international community, whether it's uh, in terms of putting pressure on Myanmar or whether it's in terms of actually supporting the refugees that are fleeing Myanmar? Yeah, I, I, yeah, as we've just heard, you know, the most serious human rights abuses that we've seen uh, in, in, in Burma, Myanmar, and the weakest international response that, that we've ever seen. You know, there have been words, but very little action. You know, as we just heard, you know, a holiday ban for uh, a few uh, handful of senior generals. But what we've seen consistently from the international community is really a policy of appeasement to to the military um well they've they've invested very heavily in this so-called reform process that's been going on and time and again we've seen the rights of rohingya have been come second place to pursuing uh this uh policy of supporting Burma's so-called democratic transition. And that's really what has given you know, the background to the genocide that we've been witnessing in Burma, because every time that uh, repression has been increased against Rohingya since 2012, we've seen a real escalation in, in violence and repression against them. Each time that a move has been made against the Rohingya, uh, an act of violence, a new repressive uh, regime, you know, the international community has backed down. Right. And this has given a, a green light to, to, to the Burmese military. But that's right. what we really need uh, to see. And sorry, uh, Ms. Roberts, since we're running out of time, uh, that we'll have to leave it uh, there. Thank you so much for joining us from uh, London. That was Anna Roberts. And thank you, Mr. Nason Lynn, for joining us from Frankfurt. Thank you for watching in this special. We will see you again tomorrow with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.